California and getting ready to go. We'll start with a roll call, please. Yes. Chair Corgan? I'm here. Vice Chair Abby Koga? Here. Alternate Director Inda? I'm here. Alternate Director Ulo? Here. Director Miller? Here. Director Sinks? Here. Director Rennie? Here. Director Gibbons? Here. Director Cortese? Here. Director Craig? Here. Thank you. I will note that Directors Harney, Bruins, and Smith are currently absent. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, first item as uh, opportunity for members of the public to make a comment here tonight. If there's any members of the public who would like to address this um, body, they're welcome to step up to the podium. We'd ask that you fill out a speaker card just so we have your name properly spelled in our minutes. Hearing and seeing none, I'm going to move on to the consent calendar. Anybody wish to pull any items off tonight's consent calendar? Seeing and hearing none, I'd like a motion to accept tonight's consent calendar. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> Terrific. They're fighting over it. I'll let you pick out who your second is. I say Liz definitely beat me. <laughs> uh, do I need a roll call vote uh, or can we just call? Okay, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Thank you. And the next item is the regular calendar. Number two, the CEO report. Hello. Members of the board, uh, Irish Bansh and CEO. So um, I want to give you a little employee update. We have two new uh, interns, and uh, that's listed in, our, in my report. But also wanted to inform you that one of our employees, Sarah Jo, uh, she has left us to a great job as sustainability manager for WeWork. So last Friday was her last day. So we regret to see her go, but she's moving on to bigger things. Uh, I'm going to now hand over uh, my time to Hillary, who is going to give you an update on the PCIA decision. So we'll basically move on to the regulatory and legislative update. Is this working? Oh, yep. There we go. All right. Good evening, directors. It, uh, after many months, in fact, almost about a year now, of work on the PCIA, we have finally gotten some clarification on phase one. So that is going to be the main item tonight. I will also go through some updates on a few of the other key proceedings. But I know PCIA is at the top of everybody's list, so we'll start with that. So most of you have probably heard the main contours of the news on this by now. The last phase here kind of started in August when we got a proposed decision from the administrative law judge in this proceeding, uh, Judge Roscoe. That, that was followed two weeks later by an alternate proposed decision from the assigned commissioner, Commissioner Carla Peterman. Those two documents were significantly different and the CCA community, including SVCE, was strongly in favor of the PD as of over the APD, over the alternate. So there was a lot of back and forth uh, through August and September with the commission staff on those two documents. And then, and so the, devote, the vote was delayed twice. It was originally supposed to be in mid-September and was eventually pushed back to mid-October as there was internal discussion at the commission about how those documents could be revised. So then fast forward to October 5th, we finally get revisions to the alternate proposed decision and a few days after that, the proposed decision. And then the vote happened at the commission on October 11th, where unfortunately the alternate proposed decision was uh, unanimously passed by the commission. And it was actually, it was a pretty short uh, meeting. The comments by the commissioners were kept to about five minutes apiece, I would say. There had been a lot of conversation on this through ex partes, through the media, and I think basically the commissioner's minds were quite made up when they went in. So let's look a little more closely at the final version of the alternate proposed decision that was approved. And I would say, broadly speaking, when we look at where we have come out compared to the testimony that Cal CCA put forth in March on this, there was kind of a, there were two parts to that testimony. One, looking at immediate improvements to sort of incremental improvements to the methodology that could be implemented starting in 2019. Most of those had to do with how you calculate the market price benchmark, which is the essential metric for calculating the PCIA that you subtract from 
the costs of the PCIA eligible contracts to determine how much residual is left to be collected from the CCAs. So the short version of where we come out in the APD is that the commission did not accept CalCCA's main arguments on how the market price benchmark should be calculated with the result that that benchmark is going to be lower than we think it should be, which will result in a higher PCIA than we think is correct. So on that front, uh, that was not a victory for the CCA community. The second piece is about um, the longer term solutions for reassessing what we should do with the resources, with the excess resources in the IOU's portfolio. And so what, the, what Cal CCA proposed in March was something called a staggered portfolio auction, where those excess resources would essentially be put back out into the market for entities who have increasing demand uh, to have a chance to bid on. So all of those longer term proposals, which, and there were some from other stakeholders as well, who adopted this kind of two part testimony proposal, those have been moved to a phase two of this proceeding. So, and that was something that both the PD and the APD had in common, that they took these longer term solutions and said these need more, uh, more deliberation and clarification, so we're gonna open a phase two. So that is expected to begin uh, in about two months. And this gives us time to essentially flesh those proposals out more and uh, focus explicitly on the longer term aspects of the testimony from March. There are some other things, I won't go through every single item in detail here, but there were some other small pieces that we do think are significant improvements. For example, there's going to be a prepayment option for the PCIA now. So CCAs have the opportunity to essentially buy out their PCI obligation ahead of time if they would like to. There's also, uh, there are two other pieces that we hope could be addressed in phase two, but it does not look like they are likely to be, which is additions to the market price benchmark, premiums for GHG free and ancillary service qualities of products, because as of now, those are not captured in the market price benchmark. We tried to get them included in the phase one decision and the commission rejected them. So we will continue to address these issues uh, in phase two of this proceeding, which is expected to run through October of next year. So this leaves us with the question of uh, where are we at the end of phase one? We're about a year into this proceeding, and this is kind of the first big break point that we've reached in terms of clarity on the commission's position. So the most important thing to say here is that uh, SVC is not going anywhere. Our budget assumptions have been very conservative for quite a while now. This uh, decision from the commission is very unfortunate, but not unexpected. And we have been planning for something similar to this essentially since we saw uh, the, the breadth of proposals that came out in March and have been and participated in ongoing com conversations with the commission through the summer. So there is definitely going to be a financial impact on SVCE, but we do not see it as uh, threatening our fundamental viability. So the thing to remember then going forward is that in terms of absolute impact on the PCIA, the focus now moves in the next couple of months to the era proceeding, which is the energy resource and recovery account. We go through that proceeding every year. That's where the PCIA numbers are fed into the methodology. So the key date on that is November 7th. That is the first time we will receive an update in the era proceeding that actually combines the numbers from PG&E this year, the cost, uh, the, the cost data from their contracts with the new PCI methodology. And that is also where we will see the changes to PG&E's regular generation rates for the upcoming year. So the PCIA decision in the PCI proceeding does not actually give us any concrete numbers on absolute PCIA uh, magnitude. That's where the error comes in. So our efforts on the PCI front kind of diverge now. We've been, oops, um, through most of this year, we've been able to focus very linearly on participation in phase one of the PCI proceeding. From here, we now are working on a couple fronts. We're going to be participating actively in the era, looking at how this methodology is applied to PG&E's inputs and making sure that that's done correctly. We're gonna be gearing up for phase two of the PCI proceeding, um, making sure that we have the additional resources we need for that. Um, and then finally, we are doing follow-up on the phase one decision and looking at essentially are there opportunities to appeal the aspects that we strongly disagree with, 
Um, there is a whole process for that that starts with an application for rehearing at the commission. So all of that is still, um, none of that is concretely decided at the moment, but basically the day after that commission meeting, um, everybody kind of jumped into, into action to map out where we're going from here. So that's being actively worked on at the Cal CCA level and throughout the CCA community. So that is where we are on the PCIA. I'll pause for a second. Are there any further questions on that? Anyone? Yes. <clears throat> Rod. In, in your slide uh, number four, I guess, you say the, P the phase one decision does not compromise SVCE's ability to continue providing customers with affordable carbon-free power. Uh, there are a couple of ways one could read this. Um, I think you said it that this doesn't this doesn't challenge our our viability to keep going at this point. But um, does it not compromise us to some degree? Let me be very clear on that point. Ge maybe Girish would also like to respond. Absolutely. It's a fundamentally, bottom line, this cuts our margin significantly. So when we presented to you financial forecasts, we had uh, a certain trajectory of when we would meet minimum reserves. That's going to take a longer time. So we're still in the black, but that trajectory is not as good as what it was. And all the money that we had uh, to look at programs and put into reserves, we're, the board is going to have to look now very critically at uh, where our real priorities are. I mean, we've. We have two more contracts tonight, um, but would this, would this uh, make us reconsider uh, the kinds of investments we can make in new renewable energy sources? So you are going to be hearing uh, about these two renewable contracts. They are under mandate. We have to do it, uh, so we don't really have a choice. Uh, we could change it and go out for try to get something cheaper, but essentially we have to by long-term contracts. Uh, in addition to the APD, in this PCIA case, we also have the direct access bill, SB 237, which also puts pressure on our net revenues. Over the next three months, we will come back to you. It's almost like a reset. Exactly where we were back at the end of 2015 and 2016, when you developed your mission statement and said, this is the kind of agency we want to be, we have to reset, given that that financial trajectory is not as positive as it was back at the end of 2015 and 16, with the additional pressure on direct access. So we're working with this internally. Uh, we also will be working with the Risk Oversight Committee and then bring it up to you. So we'll have an update to our strategic plan uh, to see if we need to tweak programs and for the purchases of renewable power. Good, I appreciate that. I, I'm just concerned that this slide might leave the board members of the public to be complacent about the effect of this decision on, on the mission and stated goals of our organization. So thank you for that. Any other questions from the board up here? Hillary, thank you for your excellent report, for all your work on this over and over. Was... Oh, more? Fantastic. Well, I'll, if, we're, if we're okay on time, I'll just say actually this, this uh, dovetails well with what you were saying about procuring resources. A quick note on the resource adequacy proceeding. So this, uh, if you recall, the, the fundamental question here is how one would structure a central buyer for local RA, which is something that the commission expressed interest in back in the summer. So that, that has taken kind of an unconventional path procedurally, but what it boils down to is a question of whether Cal CCA's proposal that a central buyer do only the last critical um, uncontracted facilities that were the reason for potential uh, need for a central buyer in the first place, or whether they just do 100% of the local RI buying for all LSEs. So it is looking increasingly possible that the commission may choose a 100% central buyer mechanism where individual LSEs would not be purchasing local RA at all anymore. And one of the key things that we are emphasizing in that proceeding, regardless of what the final structure looks like, is that CCAs and other LSEs retain all the local RA credit for resources that they, that they, that they build, because we want to make sure that we don't destroy the incentive for LSEs to be building their own local RA resources. 
So that's RA, and then very briefly, um, we're also getting this month the first look from the CPUC at the aggregated impacts of the integrated resource plans that were uh, submitted back in August. So that's going to be interesting in that we're gonna find out for the first time sort of how well the IRP process worked in its first cycle and what the commission's response to that is gonna be in terms of uh, contemplating whether they feel that additional procurement is needed to get the industry where it needs to be on emissions by 2030. So those are the big three, and I'll say very briefly on the legislative side, you're gonna get a report from Rod on the October 5th legislative ad hoc meeting, but also planning for the next session is in full swing at Cal CCA, and we are participating actively in that, um, as well as on our own front. So I'll leave the rest of that to Rod, and any further questions on regulatory issues? Thank you, Hillary. Thank you. Back to you, do you have anything else in your CEO report? I, I would love to just ask you a quick question, if you don't mind, I saw it in the written report, but perhaps just to give us a high level um, feedback on how the study group went with Rocky Mountain. Didn't yes, um, it was really good. Um, I've actually not been through such a rigorous process. There was a lot of staff time involved in preparing for the meeting. Uh, we had uh, 28 different individuals, just amazing folks from Stanford, uh, Department of Energy, National Renewable Energy Labs. We had folks including the alternate for Los Altos Hills, uh, Mr. Schmidt was at the meeting, we had community members, we had Bruce Carney, uh, Joint Venture Silicon Valley, so a wide variety of stakeholders who had different levels of expertise. We went through five different futures dealing with mobility, uh, multifamily, um, so we had a number of different future vignettes. Uh, we've Pull together all the notes. It'll be shared with the member agency working group uh, that's meeting tomorrow. And we're also gonna socialize it among a variety of stakeholders over the next month. We plan to bring those results. We're gonna formulate our recommendations and bring it to you in December. So, Terrific. Sorry, it went well. Terrific. Thank you. So um, with no other questions, let's move on to item number three. This, uh, tonight we're looking to uh, uh, adopt resolutions authorizing two different contracts. I believe the um, presentation will be made by, there we go, Monica and Dennis. Good to see you. Good evening, directors. Uh, my name is Monica Padilla, and I'm the director of Power Resources, um, otherwise known as Dennis's replacement. So, <laughs> um, so tonight we bring to you two power purchase agreements for your approval of a resolution that would authorize um, Garish, our CEO, to actually execute these agreements. And uh, just by way of overview. So I kind of came in late to this process, obviously, and, but I get to take full credit for um, Dennis's success in um, essentially issued an RFO back in September of 2017. And so through that process, we got, I believe, about 87 proposals and we narrowed it down to three, and you actually approved one of the power purchase agreements for wind out of New Mexico back in June. Uh, so tonight, the two solar plus storage contracts we bring to you actually have already been approved by Monterey back in October. So we are kind of the last step in this process, so hopefully we can get through this pretty quickly. So I'm going to skip the recommendation and come back to it at the end, but um, I'll just quickly go through some background. So SB 350, which was passed back in 2015, essentially set an RPS goal of 20, by 2030 to get to 50%. And within that goal, it also specified that 65% of the resources had to come from long-term uh, solar res or renewal resources. And by long-term, they defined those as being uh, at least 10 years or greater in term. And the first time that we have to demonstrate that we can meet this particular compliance requirement is during compliance period number four, which is 2021 to 2024. 
Additionally, um, back, I guess just this last summer, the, uh, the board approved an IRP and a strategic plan, which further kind of emphasized our policy or our goal to get to a 50% RPS and to get those through what we call bucket one or PCC one resources. And then most recently, SB 100 passed, which I believe was just in September. And that, what that did is it, well, two main things. One, it increased the RPS uh, to 60% by 2030. And it also set a kind of high level goal to get to carbon free by 2045. So essentially the whole state, all of us collectively will get greener hopefully by 2045. And then the last, I already mentioned that we issued an RFO in September. So with that, I'm going to actually pass it to uh, Dennis since he has been the project manager of this RFO since I think the inception and um, has, again, led most of the negotiation on all of the PPAs with the different developers. And I just want to say uh, he's done a great job and, and really taught me a lot about solar plus storage. So I'll, let, I'll leave it to him. Thank you, Monica. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the board, I'm excited to be back at Silicon Valley. Um, and I am hopeful that Monica and I can get you charged up so that you discharge your votes for these two PPAs. How's that? All right. And you wore the tie to match. <laughs> That's right. I, and that joint tie, tie does it too. Joint tie, yes. Um, so just as Monica mentioned, we issued this RFO in September of last year. Got a lot of bids um, and narrowed it down to three. We did the one wind farm in New Mexico in June. And so these two tonight are the solar plus storage PPAs. I will say that it's really going to set the standard in the industry for this. These, we spent a lot of time negotiating the terms of these deals, and they're really going to set the industry standard going forward. Um, <laughs> so with that, I'll, I'll get into the uh, first project that we're bringing to you tonight. Um, the RE Slate project is, is uh, being developed by Recurrent Development. Um, it's a 150 megawatt solar facility, 45 megawatt uh, capacity um, battery that will be able to discharge about 160, uh, 180 megawatts uh, per discharge cycle. Um, it's in Lemoore, uh, California, Kings County, and their expected start date is June 2021. Uh, it's Monterey and Silicon are going to split at 45-55, um, and this will represent about 5% of Silicon Valley's uh, load. Um, just a little bit about um, Recurrent, just want to, you know, they, they've been around since, uh, they're headquartered in San Francisco, they've been around since uh, 2006, and they have a large portfolio, about two, two gigawatts of installed solar uh, throughout the country. Um, and they, they, they do business with other CCAs as well. Um, the second project is being developed by EDF Renewable Energy. Uh, this is called the Big Bow Solar Project in Kern County near, near the city of Rosemond. Um, this is going to be 128 megawatt um, solar plus uh, 40 megawatt lithium ion battery, um, which is capable of discharging about 160 megawatts per discharge cycle. Um, and they're expected to come online in uh, December 2021. And, and I didn't mention, but this one is a 20 year power purchase agreement and the RE slate is a 15 year power purchase agreement. And each of these are re represent about 5% of Silicon Valley's load. So, I mean, for me, it's exciting is that storage, right? We've hear storage, what's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's sort of the buzzword, but it is an important uh, on managing the grid and having it there really is, is gonna help provide stability to prices as more storage gets out there, which is good for us. We'll be able to procure power at a lower cost. Um, to, just to talk a little bit about the process is that with this solar plus storage is that during, you know, the solar farm is going to be producing between 9 and 5, 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. every day. And we can ship some of that power into the battery and bring it out later when it's more valuable. So you've heard about the duck curve. We'll, we have a slide here later to talk about that. But 
The duck curve is a, is a phenomenon on the grid whereby there's so much solar on the grid during the middle of the day that it's causing prices in the spot market to go low and even negative. And so if you can shift that power then into the evening time, then you can really um, help the grid operator help us actually make money on the battery as well. Um, so I note this nice picture of, I think it's Morgan Hill, sending the power out in the evening time. Um, so this slide is kind of meant to show what storage can provide in terms of value. And I mean, there's a lot here, but uh, the green section is really the space that in the, our wholesale world we, we care about. Uh, energy arbitrage is sort of the shifting of the energy from that solar into the battery in the day and bringing it out at night so we can actually make some money to offset the contract costs that we're incurring. Um, there's also these other services like spin and non-spin we can participate in. Uh, the blue section is another area where we actually get a lot of value. Um, resource adequacy, as we all know, is a it's a it's a challenging product that we are required to purchase. Adding a battery to a solar facility it greatly increases the RA value of that project. Um, so that so that's that's really valuable to us there. And then uh, you know the customer services are not so much areas that we can directly connected with these projects, but batteries can play a role in that area too. Um, so on the duck curve, as I mentioned, I thought I'd share this slide. It's a, it's a pretty well-known article within the industry about the duck curve. This picture here with these uh, slide is, is the one that you, I've, I assume most people have seen. Um, and how can you teach the duck to fly is, is this article that was written uh, that kind of but storage is one of the areas where you can basically sh make the belly less deep and the neck lower. Because remember, the neck curve, the neck is a problem too that we often don't talk about is that the belly causes prices to go low or negative. But as that solar tapers off in the evening, the grid operator has to turn on a bunch of conventional power plants. And their studies are showing that the pollution is worse because of this duck curve phenomenon. So. So if we can teach the duck to fly with storage, then we're going to mitigate the head down. Yeah, lower the neck of the duck. Yes. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Monica to talk through some of the uh, RPS compliance mandates. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, um, part of the reason we're doing this well, two parts. One is we want to get to a 50% RPS as directed by the board. But the second is that we want to be able to achieve that long-term uh, procurement compliance requirement that's set forth in SB 350. So you can see here that if all three resources come online, um, that is the wind one that we already approved and the two uh, solar plus storage, it still doesn't get us quite to where we want to be. I don't know if I have like a little pointer here, but right here. So this dotted line here is essentially what we have to get to in order to achieve our long-term procurement requirement. But this line up here, this line here, this dark dotted line, is where we have to get to to um, achieve our RPS mandate. And then the one above that is where we need to get to in order to achieve our um, board directed policy. So essentially what I'm saying is that even with these three contracts, we're still going to have to buy more, assuming our load continues um, on the path that we're assuming right now. In terms of next steps, um, one is to approve this resolution, or these two resolutions, so that we can execute these contracts. And then once we execute the contracts, we'll continue to monitor the progress of um, development and, and online for these three PPAs. Um, in the meantime, Dennis and I actually continue to talk to many developers um, about other opportunities to get to our RPS requirements. And so uh, we're either going to look at how we can perhaps take another one of those opportunities and bring them back to you in some form or issue another RFO. And in that RFO, uh, we intend to look at several different types of alternatives to achieve our RPS and our requirements, including maybe continuing to do remote renewables like we're doing today, things that are cited outside of our area. But we'll also look at local renewables and non-wire alternatives. Now, these last two have the um, 
pretty much are going to be more expensive than what you would get from a remote renewable resource. And so if we do go down the path of trying to solicit opportunities for more localized renewable resources, then it's most likely going to come at a premium and we'll have to have that discussion in the context of our value proposition and, and where we are with respect to our finances. So we hope, like Garish mentioned, to bring all that back in the form of an updated strategic plan um, or even an updated IRP. So we'll be doing that in the next three to four months as well. But getting back to tonight, um, what we're looking for specifically is a motion, oops, excuse me, a motion to adopt the two resolutions, authorizing the CEO to execute the power purchase agreements and the ancillary services agreements, or ancillary documents. Thank you, Monica and Dennis. Nice to see you. Uh, are there questions of Monica or Dennis from this board? Yes, please. I would move the resolution, the recommendation. Well, hold on one second before okay. I'm looking for questions first for the two speakers, then I'm going to open it to public comment and then oh, I'm going to bring you. it yes. back up here I'm sorry. for discussion and motion. Right. Yes, Tony. Let the record show I appreciate Mr. Sink's enthusiasm for moving the item along. <laughs> Uh, I, I had a simple question that just occurred to me now, Monica, which is when, when we look at our, the graph showing the, the need to continue to lock in more power, is that assuming growth in our demand or is that just looking at the increase in the RPS? Uh, we, it assumes whatever we have planned for our load forecast, and that's a pretty relatively, it's a relatively flat load forecast. It's maybe a 1% increase on an annual basis, but not a whole lot. You're, you're not optimistic about our fuel switching efforts then. Thank you. We haven't got that far yet. I'm waiting on Amy on that. <laughs> Liz, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm just curious. Um, so everyone else in um, the CCAs has to do this exact thing. And we've been fortunate to be maybe a little more um, proactive and combining the strengths of two CCAs to pull the sum of this off and give confidence to the um, investment of what we're heading for. Um, and Dennis, you said that they were, uh, these were top of the line, unique contracts. What one or two points would you say makes these um, such exceptional um, setting the new standard? Well, the, what I mean by the first of the kind is buying renewable power is fairly standardized, but adding a battery to that created a lot of new challenges to create, provide the proper performance assurances so that we get the full value of the battery. And so we spent a lot of time negotiating around those terms. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the board tonight on this topic? Hearing none and seeing none, I'm going to bring it back up for a very enthusiastic motion from Rod Sinks. Yeah. I, you know, um, We've been working on this about a year and uh, under Dennis's leadership and now he's moved on to Monterey uh, and we've got Monica and I know they've collaborated on this and we heard about this at the risk committee in, in great detail. I'm excited that we're taking the lead on um, power procurement, solar procurement with storage. Through all of this, we've learned a lot in, in negotiating. I, I appreciate that. Um, I think we're doing, I think we're doing something that's quite uh, noteworthy and I would like to move the, the staff recommendation that we move forward with these two contracts. Second. And that would be to adopt the two resolutions, which are 2018, 11, and 12. And we're allowed to lump them together and make one motion? Yes. Terrific. So I have a motion from Rod and a second from Tony. Um, any further discussion? Or from Howard. Oh, yeah. sorry. My name was Howard. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just double check. I yeah, knew it was coming Howard. out of this side of my <laughs> Tony, Tony. stereo earphones. Thank I you, I have guys. a comment to make, though. Oh, please, make your comment. Yeah. yeah, you know, when we formed this group, this body, you know, we started looking at 70% renewable, and pretty quickly we decided that carbon-free was really, really going to be the touchstone, and, and as a group we went to the carbon free metric. Okay, the way the state accounts for it's goofy and all that stuff's gonna change over time, I get it. But we started out trying to be the cleanest and most pure. And in that regard, we looked at the real problems that were going on on the network and, and we pretty quickly felt like the duck curve was something that had to be addressed. And I am super proud of this organization taking a leadership role and jumping out and, and doing solar plus storage. 
Do you remember when we started, we were told, well, we may get a few responses and they will probably be a lot more expensive. And what we found is we got a lot of responses and before we could even finish the process, the state has said, yeah, that's what everybody ought to be doing. So I am proud of us for being leaders. And for those who say we're just shuffling around electrons through paper, I gotta say, this is our third, tonight we'll make our second and third projects where we're actually putting concrete in the ground and in this case, solar panels out in the bright sunshine with and wonderful batteries. and wonderful lithium ion batteries to back it. And we are doing what we set out to do. We are actually moving the carbon needle in the United States and here in California and specifically in Silicon Valley. Any other comments? I'd like to call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? It passes unanimously. Thank you both for your work. Dennis, we hated to see you go, but we thank you for helping get the ball rolling on this. Chair Corrigan? Yes. I'm sure we all want to, to add to Howard's comments, but maybe we could just quickly do a round of applause. Uh, that thank would be terrific. Much more efficient. I would like Dennis to disclose where that tie came from. <laughs> I think he made it. It was a gift from Andrea, from everybody. <laughs> Is, <laughs> on my last day here at Silicon Valley. That is the most amazing yeah. tie. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <coughs> okay, um, moving on to item number four, to approve the timing of the chair and vice chair committee selections. You'll see in the um, packet there is um, specifically, we've already had some discussion about this and how we did it last year. Um, is, is there any discussion at the day us tonight about uh, you don't like the way we've done it or would you like to do it differently? Um, I would like to suggest we do it the same way we've done it in the past um, and allow anybody interested to send an email in that says I'm interested in the role. Um, it looks like January makes the most sense and then appointing um, the other uh, appointments in February where we have new members that have been seated and transitioned. How, how does everybody feel? Anybody have any thoughts here? I like the recommendation. Okay. So um, I guess I need a motion to approve that Don't as you well. need all that public comment? Oh. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, now I'm the enthusiastic one. Over the top. Okay, great. Anybody from the member, any member of the public that would like to come and discuss this and say anything to this board about it? No, hearing none and seeing none. Back I, we're here. going to accept for that over enthusiasm. I'll move, I'll move the recommendation. So we're appointing the chair and vice chair in January and the committees in February. One clarification would be the executive committee would be also appointed in January. Which one? The executive committee and then the other committees would be appointed in February. Okay, yes. That's Maybe for the purpose of the public, we should show slide three, which is the recommendation we're voting on. Yeah, and I'm not sure your mic was on, um, Greg, so I want to make sure we can hear exactly. So it's a, a point, Silicon Valley Clean Energy Chair and Vice Chair and Executive Committee members in January with the remaining committees assigned at the February Board of Directors meeting um, with the selection process used in 2018. Second. That is correct. And also what we need to do is we'll have to come back with an amendment to the operating rules and regulations at the next meeting. So with this motion being adopted, we'll come back in November with the uh, Amendment, which is shown here as an attachment to your staff report. Terrific. Good. Any other comment or discussion? I think we have a motion by Jeannie, a second by Tony. This time it was Tony. It was Tony. Terrific. One One, t <laughs> Anthony, Tony. Um, okay, I'd like to call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? All right, let's move on. The executive committee report. I don't have anything to report. It looks like you may have something to report. No? No, nothing. Uh, I know we're meeting in, our next meeting is December? What, December, sorry to be so disorganized. Thank you, sorry about that. Our next meeting for the executive committee is December 4th at 11.30 a.m. Terrific, okay. Moving on to item number six then, the Finance and Administration, Administration Committee report. Anything nothing to report? Nothing to report. Legislative Ad Hoc Committee, Rod Sinks, anything to report? Uh, yes. Hang on. Yes, we certainly do have something to report. Um, let me just take a look here. Uh, 
So the ledge ad hoc committee met on October 5th. This was the first time since the end of the legislative session. And we had two goals for the meeting. One was to evaluate SVCE's 2017 legislative outcomes and advocacy and prepare and kick off uh, for the next legislative session. So in the first uh, part of the discussion, the committee identified strengths and weaknesses of SVCE's advocacy during the 2017 session. Committee members noted strong written and in-person coverage with state legislatures, um, but there was a lack of visibility into advocacy needs in other regions. So board members uh, could have helped, uh, could have gotten help from, from other parts of the state on legislators that we don't really much have contact with. Um, the latter half of the meeting turned to coalition building for the next session. And we brainstormed uh, stakeholders and organizations that we could establish or improve relationships with in the coming year and identified specific connections. So we each got some assignments to go reach out. Um, and we would welcome additional help from any board members um, on that outreach. The, this fall, members of the ad hoc committee will be reaching out to the organizations in collaboration with staff. We're going to meet again in November, early December to discuss our outreach project process progress and look at policy priorities for next year. And by that time, we're hoping to have a lobbyist hired um, and we'll include that lobbyist in our strategy development. I think uh, also by then we may have some idea about uh, potential bills that the CCA, CCE community may wish to uh, run next year. That concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions? No? All right, moving on to any announcements board members may have or ideas for future agendas. No, seeing none. So we are going to close this public meeting uh, and adjourn to a closed session. We will report out before fully adjourning tonight's meeting, um, but the directors are all invited to make their way to, I believe we're meeting in the staff room over here, the break room, the yeah. conference room, uh, where we'll be meeting in private before our report out. Thank Fair. you. Are we supposed yeah. to have public comment on the closed session first? Is there anybody here wishing to make public comment on our closed session tonight? No. I don't think so. I think we're good to go. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs>